Production. Recorded live. Hello and welcome to the Castle of Horror interview segment where we talk to writers and creators of today's genre worlds from Denver, Colorado. I'm your host, Jason Henderson, co-creator of the new steampunk thriller Clockworks out in paperback from Humanoids this September. This week we're talking to Mr. Greg Scott, who's just taking the art reins in the Dark Circle comic series, The Black Hood. Greg is a comic book artist who's done stints at both Marvel and DC Comics, working on series like Gotham Central and Sam and Twitch and The X-Files and Sword of Dracula, which is what you and I got together on. Yeah. He's also a film fanatic, and he typically watches, no joke, about two movies a day. The aesthetic of film informs his work more so than traditional drawing. So, um, And he's got a blog at gregscottart.blogspot.com, Greg Scott Art. Dot blogspot.com. Welcome, Greg. Hey, man. So you just told my editor what I'm doing when I should be working. Thanks for that. No, I. it's my goal <laughs> to make your, your challenges more challenging so that you, <laughs> so that you drive. Yes, you what's Greg doing? Mind. Those pages? No, he's watching movies. <laughs> I like to think that they're just playing in the background. You know? No, I'm actually like, watching them. I'm paying attention. I'm <laughs> wow. I was in a I, I have a... I, have you found this where 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 you're like watching a movie while you're working, and I find the only movie I can play like while I'm working is a movie that I've already seen so many times that I don't have to look at it. It's just sort of yeah. a comforting background. But if it's a movie yeah. I've never seen before, I'll keep looking up and basically, you know, all all opportunity to multitask is. I mean, science has insisted in recent years that multitasking is is bullshit anyway, and that we're we're simply not really capable of doing more than one thing at a time. Well, well, my big thing is, is YouTube and I watch Ted talks all day and, uh, you know, lectures and things like that. So hopefully I'm getting kind of an education while I'm, you know, throwing ink around the paper. Well, you don't really have to watch a Ted talk too. You can just, no, no, you can just, I mean, I, I listened to Anthony Rob, Tony Robbins today and I, I don't know whether he's just completely full of hooey or he's really inspired or somewhere in the middle. But I remember only one piece of Tony Robbins advice, honestly, and that was, and and I, this seems so goofy that it actually seems maybe like good advice. And he was, if you're enraged by something, you know, enraged, somebody does something, you just, you just, you're just chewed up with it. He goes, it can be really useful if you retell the story to yourself. And you use words like miffed or slightly annoyed or something like that. And by using these words that take the power out of your rage, you'll automatically dilute your rage. I sure. found that fascinating. I guess, I guess that's true. You know that yeah. that that you know. But it was very. That's the only well, thing sure, out of that you're, whole book. You're, you're essentially just re- rewiring the the pathways in your brain for you know how they're going to deal with the the information and yeah being being enraged is or being missed is pre- preferable to being yep. steamed i guess so it's like in other words that 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 person doesn't have that much power over me no matter what stupid thing they did i'm just I'm which, just, which just drives me makes me want to just shave my head with a cheese grater yeah <laughs> i I mean that whole book, "Awaken the Giant Within," and the thing I just told you about Mift. That's the only that's the only lesson I actually remember from the book. It's probably a wonderful book. All right, well let's talk about the Black Hood. The Black okay. Hood, uh, which you're taking over with what they're calling season two, episode one, which mm-hmm. comes out when? When does it hit? I think in October. I, I had the first issue done and it's being colored right now, and um, yeah, I'm really happy with it. The story is. Fantastic, and it's it's uh, he's not in Philadelphia anymore. He's moved to Los Angeles, and he's uh, being stalked by. Now I read the with... whole I read the whole season one of Black Hood, and what it was about was a cop, and you know, a big city cop, who it was. This is really kind of interesting. He became a superhero in an unusual way, which is that in the course of policing that was just sort of caught up in the in the emergency of the moment, he shot and killed a local street level superhero um, called the Black Hood. And so after that, seeking to overcome 
just his anxiety over facial facial injuries that he received in the same in the same altercation. Uh, this cop became the the new Black Hood and started, you know, going into business as you know beating the crap out of people. And he's very much a, you know, a, a Batman. It's like Batman if Batman didn't have, you know, his like chemistry degree that I presume that Batman must have and, and <laughs> just sort of worked out of his apartment. without the budget. Right, Batman without the budget, and with just a, a, a regular old mask that he's sewn together from, from. Well, I, I think the thing about Greg Hedinger, the the new Black Hood, is he's not so much driven by rage or injustice, and I think it's it's more an element of self loathing, which mm-hmm. I think is really interesting. Because he's got this this hamburger face. His face has been blasted. Yeah. In a, a shotgun. You know, this, this this crime that he broke up where the Black Hood was fighting some bad guys, one of them shot him in the face with a, yes. with a shotgun. Yeah. And then in the confusion afterwards, that was when that was when the cop turned around and shot the Black Hood. Um yeah. It's very it's it's very rare that you've got you've got a character with a ruined face and his face is ruined you know, that that also by the way, Spawn had that problem, but this is this is played extremely straight and extremely um, yeah. as realistically as, as you can, you know, which is that, you know, at first his, his voice is, his mouth is slurred, his, his speech is slurred. He has to go to, he has to, to get speech therapy and, and, and stuff like that. So, so, all right, fine. So I've blathered on enough. Now tell me, I don't understand. Why is he in LA? What's, what's happening in this season? Um, well, after the events of the first season, um, he just basically needed to leave town and, but like I said, the self-loathing, the, the, you know, self-medication and everything else, he's got a drug problem that he's dealing with. And, um, he, he's basically hiding out and among the homeless population and, and from himself more than anything else, I think. Is he and, still active uh, as the Black Hood when he's doing all this? Yeah, well, yeah, but... Not as the Black Hood, more of you know, kind of just like a burlap sack, almost like wow. um, like uh, you know, Cronenberg in um, Nightbreed, that sort of thing. You know, it's not. Oh yeah, yes, boy, I, man, that's a good call, by the way, Greg. Let's see, yeah, Cronenberg, he was wearing that sort of burlap sack. With I, I recall, he had a little it, mismatched, like it was like button eyes button. or something. His, yeah, <laughs> and a zipper for a mouth. <laughs> Cronenberg has only done a few roles, but they're always they're always memorable. I, I think the first thing I ever saw Cronenberg in, he played he played Jeff Goldblum's kind of officious and geeky manager in uh, Into the Night, which is literally one of my all time favorite movies. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that he you know just showed up on set with you know he said uh oh, skip wardrobe I have my own you know right. just <laughs> has his own mask. Have you seen Into the Night? Um, yeah, that's uh, John Landis, right? John Landis, I, I, I think that Landis is the yeah, yeah with the big yeah. with the BB King soundtrack and yeah, yeah, that was yes, yes, yeah. It, well, and and I was gonna say it's all over LA. I mean, it is it is a perfect LA love letter kind of movie. Like if we were to put together, you know, what are like what are like five movies that you would want to be playing so that you'd be getting your uh, your art reference, you know? Well, for well, for you. me, it's it, it's uh, you know. Uh, Collateral, the um, Michael Mann film with uh, with Tom Cruise, or Hickey and Boggs, which was directed oh, by yeah. Robert Culp. Robert Culp directed that man, and I think uh, Walter Hill did the screenplay. Um, what I love about but, Hickey and Boggs. Do you remember at the at the end? You know, I, I I'm going to keep talking about Cosby because I like Cosby as an actor, even though you know sure. Cosby has some major issues, but. What I like about Hickey and Boggs, there's that moment on the beach at the end when uh, Cosby Cosby is confronting the, the the bad guy who I believe may have killed Cosby's wife, and Cosby realizes that he's run out of bullets and he just sort of waggles the gun in the air, and it's the most there's just sort of the, and Culp runs up and just gives him another gun, and. What was great about it is is that it was done so well. It showed how perfectly these two guys were were partnered. So that there wasn't that you know just minimal communication was required. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the sort of thing that I love about movies of the '70s that you don't have.
have so much anymore is these little just kind of moments that are just, I mean, for all I know, they talked about that, you know, 10 minutes before they started rolling you know, and, and just yeah. Culp said, okay, go with it. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. love that sort of stuff. But yeah, I love, I love, I love Collateral. I love, uh, you know, Dickie and Boggs. Um, uh, Altman's, uh, you know, Marlowe story with uh, Hello Long Goodbye. You think about oh, yeah, Long, Long Goodbye. Jesus, Long Goodbye. That's, that we, uh, the the thing that amazes me about Long Goodbye. Do you remember like the point when, uh, God, that's, that's Elliot Gould, right? So yeah. Elliot Gould is out on his on his own balcony and he's talking to the girls like on the next balcony because they're having a party, and there are all of these conversations going on like around the frame. It's like a Mort Drucker image. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, well, that's very much an Altman thing where, you know, people are talking over each other and you have that sort of blanket of sound, which, yeah, you know, again, I, I think they, I love that kind of stuff where they just kind of like wet with it, which you don't see yeah. so much. In it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't even know what technique you use. I don't know if it means you're going to like spend a week rehearsing everybody's just doing their thing and so that when you start rolling everybody's in character i i have no idea you know um but yeah god long goodbye is, is so beautiful yeah those are those are ones that sort of use actual la you know running around outside la do you think that that's something that you kind of have to go to the 70s to see a lot of um because there's less like <laughs> I mean, Less to me, creative. L.A., I, it's, it's, you know, I'm a New Yorker through and through, but to me, L.A. is just, you know, the car culture, and it's, it's an alien landscape to me. It's just, it's too much driving, it's too big, it's too, you know, God, it's, it's, you got to be like, uh, you know, it seems to me you just go out for, for a dinner and you got to plan an expedition. I, I can live like that. So, I, yeah, to me. So, you know, I agree. But I loved it. I, 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 I mean, I will never leave Colorado, to my knowledge. I don't, I don't know if I ever will. But um, I love LA. I mean, I, I had such a blast. You know, last year I was researching surf movies, and I went and stayed out at Laguna Beach for like a week, and it was just so great to like walk around and these among a lot of these hotels that hadn't changed considerably since the early '60s. You know, and you think like. Here where the sun is setting and, and there's these trees and, and you can just imagine like George Burns or, or, <laughs> or you know, like any, uh, any of those dudes, you know, from the, from the middle of the century, like coming up, Vic Morrow, coming up here and like hanging out with a Mai Tai, you know. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but. Um, okay, so uh, wh- I, I have to I have to ask you actual stuff about the work. So this is and and uh, or to attempt to drag this back. So this is basically going to become what I would call California noir. I mean, you were talking about uh, what was the one you were talking about that wasn't from the middle of the century, the uh, Collateral. I mean, is that yeah. is that an example? Yeah, I mean, I you know, it, well, it's it's Michael Mann. You know, again, his I, I think his his best films are you know. Heat and, and collateral, and you know the, the LA. To live and die in movie. LA was also Michael Mann. Pardon me. Wasn't it? Was to live and die in LA Michael Mann, or was that? No, uh, that was. Oh God, only thing I remember about that was they had the Wang Chung soundtrack. Yeah. Well, then I then, then and Wade Peterson got shot in the face, and I, I I for some reason I knew he was he was not going to make it to the end of the movie. I don't know why. <laughs> No, but you know, there's a there's a version of To Live and Die in L.A. where he actually where where William Peterson does survive, like what? where no oh listen I am not making this up, but you know how at the end William Peterson who plays a Secret Service agent who also is running all kinds of scams on yeah. the side and bus hookers but also sleeps with hookers and. Then at the end, out of nowhere, somebody walks up with a shotgun and shoots him in the chest. And that's the end of William Peterson. And um, Pankow, right? John Pankow, yeah. his partner, yeah. becomes the new kingpin, uh, you know, the, the, the new corrupted cop, and, and that's the end. Well, believe was it or that not. Friedkin? Is, was that William Friedkin? It was William Friedkin. Okay. Yes. All right. That makes sense. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> um, you know, fresh off of uh, The Exorcist. Well, not quite. I mean, like eight or so years off the exorcist, but regardless. Um, so After there is a version it. where after William Peterson gets shot in the chest and falls to the bottom of the, to the locker room floor dead, there's a 
the version where you then cut to, I can't remember what kind of, of information dump, and then you're like flying over the mountains, and you come across, and you're hearing the news talk about how these gangsters got caught, and the good guys are recuperating in a hidden location, and I am not making this up. You go into a cabin where William Peterson and John Pankow are drinking fucking hot chocolate and recuperating from their wounds. This is... <laughs> All right, God. No, okay. Well, okay. That's my... Thank you. That's my uh, my white whale I'll be searching for. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I, I have no doubt that William, uh, that Friedkin filmed this, like, under protest. He was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God. Yeah, and didn't uh, um, didn't he get shot in the face too in the locker room? It wasn't. In I don't the, remember the face. All I remember is a big, big like imprint of buckshot over the most of his chest. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I don't want to get too far off, you know. But we mentioned Collateral, so I have a yes. I have a theory about Tom Cruise film. Yeah. Have yeah. you ever noticed how many Tom Cruise movies he gets? his face altered or smashed or he has to wear a mask or something covering his face. I hadn't really given it any thought, I guess. Um, okay. Well, the mission impossible uh, movies, he's always wearing a mask that's in, true. Van- yep. in vanilla sky. Um, half mask. the movie he's wearing that mask. Yeah. yeah. Um, in, um, oh, Help me out here, because there's I, there's more. Well, um, in, in Live Die Repeat, he keeps getting squished. I mean, there's, oh, his face. In, okay, in Live Die Repeat, his face gets burned the first time that alien. Um, yeah. In in that one, uh, what, what was the one where Robert Downey Jr. plays a black actor, uh, and and they're like, oh yeah, uh, okay, yes, he's less Grossman. He's wearing he's wearing a ton of makeup right. in there. He's he's hardly yeah, recognizable. Yeah, he's completely he's unrecognizable. Likewise, I guess if you want to get into this, as the rocker in uh, um, that uh, that rock and roll oh, musical, Stacy uh, Jacks. Yeah, uh, uh, well, he's got the long hair implants and stuff, but that's not really. I mean, like like yeah, in minority like in Minority him. Report, there's that uh, scene where he injects himself in the face and his face swells up. That's true. Um, so why, that so all right, so so you're you've noticed that that Tom Cruise seems to oh he gets shot in the face in Collateral. All right, so he cottons to stories where his face gets injured or, or disrupted in some major way. And, what's and, your theory? And, what the hell is going on with that? I don't know, man. I mean, am I totally full of cat hair, or is, you know, is this a real thing where he's attracted I, somehow? Because well, he can't I mean, be a commitment, right? I, it's, you know what? I think sometimes it's not a coincidence. I, I, I think it's possible, you know, like Stephen King, for instance, as a writer who writes a lot, he likes to go back to some of the same jokes over and over again. You know why? Because they comfort him. But the fact that he keeps that he keeps going to them means that they they are comfortable. They mean something to him. You know, and and I think that that has to be what's going on here. You know, probably Cruz reads a script, reviews a script, probably as powerful as he is, looks at the versions of the script as they come in, and continues to have power over whether they get shot. So when he sees, oh, and Tom gets his face turned into hamburger, he signs off on it every time. There's not a mechanism <laughs> in his head that goes, well, you know what? I did this in the last movie. Instead, it's I did that in the last movie, and uh, all right, that works for me. So, you know, so you tell me. You know, because other guys are so egotistical that they'll be like, listen, uh, there's a thing here where it says that I burn my hand, but I actually don't like to show pain. You know, and and you would cut. You know, there are people like that. Cruz isn't. Yeah, and initially he was he was allegedly supposed to be cast as Iron Man instead of Robert Downey Jr. So they would be okay. wearing a mask most of the time. Yeah. I mean, I could. You know, I'm I don't glad know. they went the way they did. Hey, what do you feel about about Cruz as um, as Reacher? I mean, is a Reacher supposed to be like you know this? Hulking six eight guy with yeah I mean Reacher is like described him. as looking like uh, like Jesse the Body Ventura basically you know, okay. half the time he has a beard he's supposed to be giant you know arms that are like an oak tree you know <laughs> so yes 
you know, it's like my daughter, Julia, she watches, you know, like she loves Archie comics, but she can't look at Afterlife with Archie. She just, it's to her, she goes, no, that version isn't real. So yeah. that's, you know, it's, it's the movie reacher. That's, that's all it is. It's not yeah. the book reacher. If you like the book reacher, re- read those. But Tom is the movie guy. I think I, I, I actually kind of like that, that formulation that there's, there's the book reacher and the movie reacher. I think you could be, be into both of them because, sure. you know, the plots may be similar, but you're right. I mean, I, I will say that I've never seen anything like rile people up more than mentioning like Tom Cruise's reacher on the internet because the, you know, it, it makes me realize, boy, if Michael Keaton had been cast as Batman in the age of Facebook, I don't even know <laughs> if the movie would have actually been made, you know? Because people were upset about that, but it, it, it could only get so big because there was no such thing as social media. But now, you know, well, <clears throat> I'll post about it and somebody will go, you must not realize the movie, you know, the books, because Richard is supposed to be super tall. And I'm like, well... I don't know. I mean, look, Fletch was supposed to be skinny and blonde, okay? And like, and not, and not funny, huh? And not funny, Fletch and, and not funny, wasn't... right? The, the movies weren't even right, and yet nobody, nobody would object to uh, to Chevy Chase as Fletch now. Right. Yeah, that right. that vision of Fletch is so burned in that you know I I, I can't escape it. Um, yeah, it just uh, it, I I. I have to say, me personally, I think he's a good reacher. I, I think the only thing that he doesn't have that's like, like reacher is the size. But I, I can live with it. If I say anything on this podcast this year that will generate <clears throat> online arguments, I think it will be this one when I when I'm <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> if if his face is, gets ground in the hamburger in this new movie, then then I'm right. And yes. uh, also. <laughs> If if you, for you writers, if you want to get that Tom Cruise vehicle made, you know, right in that scene where his face gets uh, yeah. you know, pureed. Hmm. Speaking of writers, all right. So you and I have worked together. I'm curious about the the process on on Black Hood. So is Black Hood a a panel for panel scripted comic, or 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 is it, or do you have room to to compose? The no, it's, it's full script. Go down the page. It, it's full script, but I got to tell you, Dwayne really writes very. Uh, he's, it's it's like uh, he's describing a, a film. You know, it just breeds cinema, and his he he really he really knows uh, flow, and you know he'll he'll have the establishing shot and pull back, and you know he, he leaves room in there for you to to do your thing. And so far, man, it's just seamless and. You know, it's just a real joy. I mean, um, this first issue, I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping people will like it because I sure had fun doing it. That's fabulous. That's that's really fabulous. So does he? I'm curious. Do, you know, because I always ask people about process, right? Um, and most of the people I talk to on this show tend to actually be novelists. But, but like when when you get that script, does it break it up into scenes? Like a typical comic book. I presume from Archie, in this case, Dark Circle, which is part of Archie, typical comic book, 22 pages long, correct? That's not changed. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So, and, uh, of course, a comic is typically broken into scenes, typically like, I don't know how many scenes per issue, probably six or seven scenes per issue, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. It, yeah. For, well, he, are they broken out in the script where it says scene one, Page one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, one. he'll do panel one, panel two, panel three. But also, what I really like <laughs> is that he doesn't, you know, you know, he he lets the action breathe. None of this, you know, eight nine panels per page, you know, and it's, yeah. you know. Yeah. If you were if you were recommending to uh, a, an artist or writer somebody who's going to do both, how many panels per page would you say that they typically have to aim for? Well, if it's action, you know, you don't want really a lot of small crop tiny panels you want to let let it breathe you want to show what's going on and move pull the camera back but if you have a page that's really crowded with too many panels i mean unless it's you know choreographed that way which sometimes is specific but yeah well i mean for instance i'm thinking about action in uh in uh 
the Black Hood, you know, sometimes there's a scene where it's just the Black Hood and his former partner talk about a crime standing around the Black Hood's desk, right? So yeah. it's you're in a room, they're at a desk, two people are talking, the whole page is going to be talking. So to me, how those panels get laid out honestly could might as well be artist's choice, you know, with, with uh, because, you know, you know what the – you know what the lines are going to be. You know what the story. Yeah. You know what, what needs to be said. Well, but, actually, uh, I think I have deviated a bit from the script, and no one said anything. So I, I don't. You know, it's like uh, the Hippocratic Oath: first do no harm. So I guess I'm yeah, not no hurting. Harm. Exactly. Yeah. Have you ever found yourself fixing something? I don't mean something where it's incompetent, but where you're going along and you're going, "Oh, I just realized that there's a big opportunity here that I can that I can change." And oh, in that sure. Case, All the do time. You call the artist. Do you call the writer up, or what do you do? I mean, you know, sometimes, well, okay, it depends, because sometimes I don't do anything and just hope it gets through. Sometimes I'll, I'll let the editor know if it's, a, if it's a big deal. But, you know, usually they know that, you know, you know what you're doing, and, yeah. you know, this, this is, you know, I got this. Right. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, seriously, when I first started, you know, every job was like running a marathon on my knees on glass. Yeah. And you know now I'm I'm feeling more comfortable and confident, and you know I get up and the, the blank page every day isn't you know like the abyss staring back at me. It's like oh, okay, I know what I got to do with you. So, so so to that end, how um you know you're doing a, a book a month at least. Mm-hmm. So if you're doing twenty two a book a month is twenty two pages an issue, and that means basically you you got to knock out a page a day. I mean, uh, assuming. Assuming yeah. there's a world where you take Saturdays and Sundays off, which I have no idea if that's the case. Yeah, but, you know, also sometimes if I take a couple extra days off, I, it's just, okay, I have to make this time up, and I just do it, you know. And yeah. It must be interesting to set your own schedule that way, like to just go, you know what, I got no – I get nobody looking over my shoulder except for the fact that I myself know that those editors will find somebody else to do this work. Yeah, I mean, my commute is, you know – six feet from my bed to my drawing table. <laughs> Come on. I'm a grown man who, you know, I, I, I draw comic books all day. I have nothing to complain about. I, I just, I'm happy. I'm really, You really live happy. in Staten Island, right? You live on... on I do. Staten. I live in, in, the, in Staten Island, New York, right across from uh, Statue of Liberty. God, I'll tell you, that ferry is so... I, I'm surprised we don't see more stories that take place on the ferry. Because I'm fascinated by it. You know, I, I, I just think that you could have action around the ferry. You could have mystery on the ferry. It's just the, something so fascinating about a big free ferry that all these Well, I've been riding that ferry for years. And, you know, before 9-11, it was really like the wild, wild west. I mean, you know, you could, they, used to, they used to take cars over on the ferry. And, you know, you could ride your motorcycle right onto the ferry. And, you know, there was people playing boom boxes and there were street preachers and, you know. I actually saw I saw a guy snatch a purse on the ferry once. I'm not kidding. He grabbed a woman's purse on the ferry, and the deckhands were just chasing him around in circles until the boat docked. It was hysterical. <laughs> Dummy. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Do you remember you told me once a story about a, a, a ferry funeral where somebody was getting rid oh, of... Oh, God. Yes. Yes, I was, I was, okay, I was standing on the back. It was a beautiful September day. I was standing on the back of the ferry, and across from me, there was this, this guy, and he had a knapsack, and he pulled out of the knapsack an urn. And he took, he reached into the urn, and he let the ashes go a bit, and they just kind of, you know, fluttered out the, into the air. And then he takes the urn and just dumps it upside down. Uh-huh. And the ferry is moving forward, so there's this big kind of wind turbine effect, and it takes this cloud of ashes, and it deposits it on the lower deck. (laughs) Now, standing on the lower deck is a group of about 40 Japanese tourists (laughs) who look like they have had a bag of flour dumped on them. And one of them... And one of the women, 
I'm, I'm, I was just in shock. And one of the women looked up and she saw this guy holding an urn. And she, I'll never forget this older Asian lady who had on a blue velour jumpsuit that was totally <laughs> white. And she started screaming. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. That, oh, sorry. <laughs> I know. And and so I, the cops gave him a ticket, and the last thing I saw when I got on the boat, off the boat was one of the deckhands with a big broom sweeping off the, back, <laughs> the bottom deck. <laughs> you said, though... <laughs> You said that you've run into a lot of comic book guys actually over there. The, the like some of the, you know, you saw Chris Claremont on the ferry, I think. Um, you know. Just, yeah, I ran into. I, well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I ran into. Uh, I, I had actually run into a lot of comic book people on the ferry, and it was really weird that day. I ran into Chris Claremont on the ferry, and Jeff Goldblum for some reason was on the ferry that day, which. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> he's been around a long time. I mean, Jeff Goldblum shows up in in Death Wish, you know, as as one of the uh, one of the the people who break in and, and attack. Oh, is that right? God, he must have been a teenager. Wow. He was very very young. He was t- super tall, but he was very. He just looked, you know, they were they were just like you know, play up your evil grin. That was that was that was it. Right, right. But that man alive, Death Wish. You look at that. That is a New York that just doesn't exist anymore. It is. Oh like, no, no, that's. And, and, you know, it's funny when I see these tour buses and these people sitting on top of the tour buses, you know, holding on to their, clutching their purse, I wonder, yeah. like, did they watch Death Wish and that's what they think New York City is? Because New York City is totally safe. Like, no one's going to snatch your purse. No one's going to hit you in the head with a pipe. And, you know, this, this thing about New Yorkers will step over you. It's complete nonsense. I think, that was, I think that was not even true when Kitty Genovese got killed. <laughs> I mean, because it turns out that that was a myth, that lots of people called the police, that lots of people tried to, to you know, um, to get attention for, you know, a terrible crime. But that it just, it was one of those yeah. things where it was just something people wanted to believe somehow. That um, Yeah, they didn't just ignore, yes, yeah, I've heard that as well, that, that yeah, she was, she was not just ignored and screaming for help while, you know, this horrible thing was done to her, no, it was, it, People were trying to inter- intervene. Yeah. Boy, you know, it, it's funny. Um, Trump made this speech the other day, and uh, he was talking about – he was trying to – he's trying to get black votes, right? And he's making a speech going, what do you have to lose? Your your schools are failing. Right. Your, and, and your youth are on a, And I was thinking – this guy no, is he was, describing like he's, this guy's describing 1968, basically. He's describing escape from New York. You know, he thinks <laughs> that, that that black people live in this Mad Max post-apocalyptic, you know, negative utopia. Utopia. Yeah. That, that's not how. That's not people's experience. It's, yeah, yeah. It is. It is funny how these these images of urban life get, and, and these images of how other people that are not us, whoever you are get stuck in our head and might have nothing whatever to do with, with the reality of how, how life is life is going. Well it's like Bill O'Reilly, you know, going up to Harlem to Sylvia's, you know, barbecue spot and just like look at this, they're using forks. You know, like, Yeah, he was marbling. Oh my God, that was so embarrassing. That was that's it's so funny because I think the kind of racism we have to worry most about is the kind that you're not aware that you're practicing that that's like seeping into the community and is hurting people without you knowing it. But I have to say it's a lot of fun to make fun of that kind, which is just the true dumbass kind. Where, <laughs> where yes, O'Reilly. yeah, yes, Bill O'Reilly. Black people use have table manners and use utensils. They're not, yeah. Well, huh. oh, I, that, <laughs> that blew my mind. Yeah. But that's, yeah, that's the kind of thing when you, when you just make a, a grunt or some sort of a clicking sound because you have no words. It's so... Yeah, yeah. All right, so bring that back to the Black Hood. Let's bring it home. How do we... Uh, the Black Hood does not want you reading his browser history. <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> no, I, I have to, I have to say, um, I I really do admire the the very realistic and very thoughtful way that uh, that the series is being written, and and you know I I can't wait to see you bring your your interpretation to it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it's it's fun, and uh, I, when are we going to see John? some promotions? I mean, some some art from it. That's not my call. I mean, you know, on, on Facebook, I sneak some stuff out there every once in a while, some peaks, and, uh, but uh, that's not my call. To, to, you know, pretty soon, I, I guess, previews. Or Very, I, would think, I would think really soon. If, if it's an October book, we should definitely be seeing some in a couple of weeks more yeah. or less. So that's fabulous. I can't wait. I, well, Greg, Jesus, I mean, you should probably just come on like every week and, and, and just talk about whatever. <laughs> is going on. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, I mean, we covered it all. You know, Anthony Weiner, Tom Cruise's face. Uh, you know. Jesus. Sexting, <laughs> browser histories, L.A. Noir. And ashes. Cremains, my friend. Yes. <laughs> Four tourists covered in Uncle, Uncle Nicky. <laughs> Uncle Nicky loved the fairy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, have a fabulous evening. It's really been delightful talking, and um, let's uh, let's let's do it again really soon. Okay, man. Thanks. All right. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. <laughs>